But I would like to introduce Dr. Eric Levine, um, professor of neuroscience at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. Dr. Levine's laboratory explores the synaptic plasticity and neuromodulation, focusing on the roles of endogen endogenous cannabinoids and neurotrophins. Um, more recently, his laboratory has also been using patient-specific induced pluripotent stem cell-derived neurons to study the neuronal and synaptic pathophysiology of Angelman syndrome and Do50Q. This work done in collaboration with Dr. Stormy Chamberlain. I, like, I just like Dr. Stormy. That's what we should just stop at Dr. Stormy. Um, is focused on identifying molecular targets and singling pathways that could lead to novel therapeutics to Do15Q, Angelman syndrome, and related neuro neurodevelopmental disorders. So, Dr. Eric Levine. So, um, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the uh, invitation to come tell you about the work we've been doing. Uh, as Vanessa mentioned, we've been using human uh, stem cell models to uh, look at the underlying uh, pathophysiology in chromosome 15Q disorders. Um, and uh, as we know, um, most people in the audience are familiar with the fact that um, this 15Q region is uh, responsible for several uh, related disorders, uh, including Angelman syndrome, which is due to a deletion of the maternal 15Q to 11 to Q13 region. And we actually know that with Angelman syndrome, it's specifically the loss of UB3A that's responsible for uh, more or less the entire uh, syndrome. With DUP15Q syndrome, we have duplication of that same region. Uh, uh, since it is a maternal inheritance, we think UB3A probably plays an important role, but it is um, not clear yet what contributing roles other duplicated genes uh, in the region may play. And Prader-Willi syndrome is due to duplication on the, uh, sorry, deletion on the uh, paternal uh, region. So our uh, work has focused on Angelman and DUP15Q syndrome, and actually I'm going to present uh, data um, that we have from IPS models of both syndromes. Uh, most of the Angelman syndrome uh, work was uh, recently published, and the DUP data is all unpublished data. And then um, James Fink in my lab, who did a lot of the work I'm presenting uh, today, is also going to be talking tomorrow on uh, some other uh, data from the, um, uh, the DUP patients. That would be really interesting. So this is uh, sort of an idea of some of the, the questions we're, we're trying to get at um, with these models is to, to look at what the underlying cellular pathophysiology is. And we know that uh, the behavioral and cognitive phenotypes between dupe and Angelman syndrome, there are some things that they have in common, there are some things that are different. So what are the downstream signaling pathways and targets of UB3A that are responsible for some of those phenotypes? Um, how do increases specifically in UBE3A contribute to DUP15Q syndrome, and what other genes may also play a role in DUP15Q? And ultimately, could a cellular phenotype that we identify in these human cells uh, serve as a biomarker and uh, possibly be used to test efficacy of novel therapeutic strategies? <clears throat> so we're using um, these um, uh, neurons derived from patient-specific induced pluripotent stem cell lines. Uh, as Vanessa mentioned, I actually got into this work um, through a collaboration with Dr. Stormy. Uh, she, had obtained, uh, uh, she had obtained these IPS lines uh, to, look at, um, to look at the uh, genetics and the mechanisms of genomic imprinting, and we started collaborating to actually use these neurons to look at the physiology. Um, so I'll just mention very briefly, since we haven't talked about this yet today, um, we basically uh, start with samples that are either fibroblast skin samples uh, or uh, blood samples that are then transfected with um, uh, transcription factors, infected with transcription factors that uh, put them in a pluripotent state. Uh, they can then be, from this pluripotent state, differentiated into any cell type in the body. Uh, we're specifically interested in differentiating them into neurons and studying those neurons in vitro as a model for disease and potentially for drug discovery. As I mentioned, um, my lab is really interested in looking at the, the physiology, the functional properties of these cells. And so we're, of course, interested in synaptic transmission and synaptic plasticity. Those are things that are um, deficits in those properties um, relate to many of the phenotypes of these patients uh, in terms of cognitive and language disorders um, and uh, uh, susceptibility to seizures. And also, uh, model mice of these syndromes also show deficits in synaptic transmission and activity-dependent plasticity. We also take advantage of these cells to look at basic functional properties, intrinsic properties of the cells, uh, some of which are listed here. Um, this is important because these properties are, are essential during development for the proper maturation of synaptic transmission and for uh, processes of plasticity. So all of these 
properties, if they're uh, messed up, are, are going to confound each other. So any changes in, um, in these basic functional properties can have repercussions and can have enduring repercussions for processes of synaptic transmission. So although synaptic transmission and plasticity are often an endpoint that are, is looked at as a, a critical process for many different neurodevelopmental disorders, how those processes are affected and what the underlying mechanisms are uh, is a very uh, complicated question. Um, so we're interested in comparing and contrasting uh, changes in these neurons with either increased or decreased levels of UBE3A and see how they compare. And uh, these human cells give us the um, ability to look at very early stages of development, which um, are often not examined in mouse models. And we think that's important because uh, there may be uh, uh, differences in some of these intrinsic basic properties of cells early in development that could become compensated for later on that you may not see in the mature nervous system, but because those changes exist in the early developing nervous system, they can create enduring changes in the formation of neural, neural circuits and the ability of those neural circuits to undergo plasticity. So some of those underlying mechanisms may be things that are rooted in very early developmental changes that again may not persist um, throughout lifetime. So uh, before I look, talk about the functional properties, I'm just going to mention that we um, have done uh, some work to define the cellular composition um, of the cell types that are in these um, neuronal cultures, because they're not uh, just a specific type of cell. And so here's an example of some immunocytochemistry for markers for uh, glutamatergic uh, neurons, GABAergic neurons, as well as astrocytes. And uh, we've quantified this here for the uh, Angerman population. Uh, the majority of cells are glutamatergic, but there's also a population of GABAergic cells. There's astrocytes present. And uh, the important thing is that the composition of these cultures is not different between uh, the control and Angelman-derived neurons. And although it's not quantified here, uh, the same is true for the control versus uh, DUP15Q-derived neurons. So we seem to be looking at about the same population of cells. Uh, and in fact, uh, for the Angelman versus controls, we've also validated this uh, by using uh, flow cytometry for these same markers to, to quantify uh, the relative levels of these different cell types. So given that we have a somewhat uniform composition of cells, we can then go on to look at these different functional properties. So one of the first most basic properties of the cell that uh, we, we looked at is uh, the resting membrane potential. And I'm going to show you this developmental time course um, of different properties that were done, uh, so characterizing uh, each cohort of cells across all these multiple properties. And so resting membrane potential is uh, one thing that's very important in determining cellular excitability. And if you look at the blue bars, you'll see that in control cells, uh, over um, a, a very long time course that we look at the in vitro development of these neurons, the resting membrane potential shows uh, the expected hyperpolarization to more uh, mature levels of uh, resting membrane potential. And the Angelman neurons, although they start out at um, earliest stages being very similar to control cells, um, basically completely fail to show that normal developmental hyperpolarization. And so this uh, cohort of cells is actually um, three Angelman syndrome patients, um, and I think maybe four controls. And the three Angelman patients are actually two patients with the typical large deletion. And one of the patients that's included in this uh, data set has a mutation just of UBE3A. Um, so this is important because it's part of the evidence that it's the loss of UBE3A and not other differences that may exist in these patients that's responsible for this phenotype. And I'm not going to break out the individual patient data here, but in fact, the UBE3A mutation patient looks just like the large deletions. Uh, as a further validation uh, that it's UBE, UBE3A specifically uh, that's involved in this, we, um, we have a UBE3A knockout line. This was uh, generated by uh, Carissa Sorois in um, Stormy's lab. And so we took one of the control lines that's actually included in the blue bars, and um, Carissa used um, whoops, uh, um, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to knock out UBE3A, and that's shown in the, the, the red dotted line. So this gives us an isogenic uh, pair of control versus UBE3A knockout, and as you can see, the UBE3A knockout uh, mimics exactly what the neurons derived from the Angelman patients show in terms of the uh, lack of uh, maturation of the resting membrane potential. 
And so this is uh, one thing that I'll come back to a little bit at the end of the talk. This may be uh, one um, important aspect of changes in excitability of these neurons that could uh, relate to seizure susceptibility and other phenotypes. So we've done similar um, characterization of DUP15Q derived neurons. And as you can see, the, the bottom line is that the DUP15Q neurons do show more typical maturation. So the first thing I want to point out is that these control cells are actually a different population of control cells. It's, it's five um, control subjects, four of which are uh, different subjects than I, what I showed in the previous slide. So this is a nice um, sort of validation uh, of what we can see uh, in these neurons during development. And the DUP15Q um, uh, derived neurons uh, basically don't show any difference. So they show typical maturation of resting memory potential. And in these, the DUP15Q neurons that I'm going to show in this and subsequent slides is um, four patients, four DUP15Q patients. Uh, three of them are IDICs, um, isodicentrics, and one of them is an interstitial, but it's a an interstitial triplication. So it basically has that same gene dosage as the IDICs. Um, of course, one of the advantages of using this uh, human model system is we can look at the variability among human patients. And so comparing interstitials to the IDICs will be something uh, very interesting to look at in the future. For now, for just sort of um, our, our initial pass has been to focus on the IDICs to look for a consistent story. But as we heard about this morning, even looking at different uh, breakpoint duplications could be a very interesting uh, variable to incorporate um, into these data set. Um, Another control that we have that, just for clarity, I'm not going to include here, but James will probably show a little bit more in his talk tomorrow, is a paternal duplication. So as we um, heard about this morning a couple times, the um, paternal duplication of this region does cause a phenotype. It does not exactly cause the dupe syndrome. And um, in terms of the uh, parameters that we've looked at, the paternal duplication looks like the controls. So it doesn't mimic the phenotype we see in the DUP15Q neurons, again, pointing to its uh, primary role for UBE3A duplication uh, in the cellular phenotype of these neurons. <clears throat> the next property that we've looked at in these cells is the maturation of action potential firing. So uh, these are cells where we hold the resting membrane potential at a, at a normal resting membrane potential for uh, mature cells, and then we uh, inject current to look at their ability to generate action potentials. And we classify cells as either failing to fire an action potential, uh, an immature one, a single mature, or a mature train. And if you look at uh, control cells versus Angelman cells, just like resting memory potential, at early stages of development, they look very similar. And in fact, at these earliest stages, a majority of cells are already firing action potentials. A significant amount are firing mature trains, but there's also a significant proportion that are still immature. And in the control cells across development, there's a really nice maturation where you get uh, uh, an almost complete conversion over to mature action potential firing at the latest stages. And we know if we go even later, we can see almost uh, complete uh, maturation of neuronal um, uh, AP patterns. But anyway, yeah, so the Angelman neurons, uh, they basically, f they really fail to show much maturation at all here. Um, you know, you have a, a bunch of cells that are, that are, that are mature, but it's not really increasing too much. Um, and then just to throw in the UB3 knockout, it basically uh, shows the same thing. It actually does show some maturation, um, but still shows a significant population that are immature. So in the um, DUP15Q derived neurons, it, it's sort of a, an intermediate phenotype here because they actually show uh, better development over time than the Angelman neurons, but they're not quite as mature as the um, as the control neurons. And this, again, is a completely separate cohort of neurons, so they actually show greater maturity at earlier stages in development, continue to show some developmental trends. And again, the, the DUP15Q are showing some maturation, but uh, so, sort of intermediate between the Angelman and the control cells. So uh, as I mentioned, we're also, of course, very interested in processes of synaptic transmission and plus, oh, sorry, before we get to synaptic transmission, uh, we also looked at the maturation of the actual potential properties uh, when, of cells that do fire action potentials. And in particular, in this slide, um, we're looking at the AP amplitude, which is the amplitude from the threshold uh, to the peak, and also the um, uh, width of the action potential uh, at that half maximal peak amplitude. And in the control cells, in both of these cohorts, so the control versus Angelman and control versus dupe, there's an increase in action potential amplitude 
um, during development, and there's a decrease in um, the uh, amplit in the um, in the width of the action potential, which also reflects maturation of potassium channels that cause that uh, the mature action potential to have a, sh a shorter width, and. Angelman neurons basically are more variable and fail to show that clear developmental trend, and the dupe neurons also fail to show that clear developmental trend. It's a little bit more messy, but they don't show that clear developmental trend uh, that's seen uh, in the control cells. And although it didn't, we didn't plot it here, it's interesting to note that the threshold for firing an action potential is basically unchanged in control versus Angelman cells. So Angelman neurons that can fire action potentials, because they have a more depolarized membrane potential, but a similar threshold could actually be um, a potential mechanism of hyperexcitability. Uh, as I mentioned, that's not really shared by the dupe 15 q neurons. It's an area we're very interested in because of its relation to seizure susceptibility. And one of the main things that uh, James will talk about uh, in his presentation tomorrow is um, other mechanisms and channels that we think may be involved in a hyperexcitability phenotype of the dupe 15 q neurons. So turning to synaptic transmission, um, I'm going to just show you the, the dupe 15 q data right now. Uh, Angelman syndrome neurons do show deficits in basal synaptic transmission and activity-dependent plasticity, and those results are in the, the paper that we recently published. In the dupe 15 q neurons, we find uh, an increase in spontaneous synaptic transmission. So this first graph is basically the proportion of cells that are synaptically active in the cultures. And, um, as I said, in this cohort of cells, they're fairly mature, so around 60% of the cells that we record from are already receiving functional synaptic inputs at the early stages of development. And there's some you know, increase over time, uh, getting closer to maybe 80% in the more mature cells. And uh, importantly, that doesn't seem to be very different between the control and the dupe 15 q derived neurons. However, if we look at uh, both the frequency of these spontaneous events and the amplitude of these spontaneous events, uh, they're increased in the dupe 15 neurons, uh, dupe 15 q neurons, starting at the earliest stages of development and, con and continuing, you know, more or less through development. Uh, not so much seen here, but but certainly seen in the uh, amplitude changes. And uh, these changes are also uh, seen in another cohort of recordings that were done by James for another set of experiments. So that seems to be a pretty robust difference. Uh, in the increase in the frequency and amplitude of the size of the synaptic currents. So we then went on to look at the ability of these synapses to modify their strength, uh, looking at a, uh, an activity-dependent synaptic plasticity paradigm. So in these cultured neurons, we're using a form of a sort of a chemically-induced LTP. And so specifically what we're doing is we're um, bathing the cells in a cocktail uh, that includes um, uh, uh, an adenylcyclase activator and a phosphodiesterase inhibitor whoops, that will um, give us a sustained increase in intracellular cyclic AMP, and that's also done in the presence of uh, a magnesium-free bath solution, which enhances NMDA receptor activation. So this is, there are many different forms of these kinds of LTP. This is one of the standard um, paradigms that's been used in cultured um, rodent neurons to look at plasticity, and then we can monitor the spontaneous activity at, during baseline during the induction period, and then upwards uh, of an hour or two post-induction. And so when we look at the dupe 15 q neurons compared to controls, what we find is that during the induction period, during the presence of the, the forskolin and the low magnesium, there's a pronounced increase in activity, and that's seen as both an increase in both the amplitude and frequency of events. And if anything, the dupe neurons are showing a, a more pronounced increase in amplitude than the control neurons. So they, they don't seem to be at all deficient in their ability to respond to that stimulus. But if you look up at around an hour post-induction when this has been washed out, you see that in control cells, there's a sustained and significant increase in both the amplitude and the frequency whereas the dupe 15 q neurons show basically no sustained increase in amplitude and a reduced um, increase in the synaptic frequency. So they seem to show an impairment in this ability to uh, manifest this activity-dependent synaptic plasticity. And so going back to what I said at the beginning, what we're very interested in doing is trying to tease out what might be the underlying mechanisms that are responsible for differences in plasticity, which we think are probably very um, uh, relevant to behavioral and cognitive phenotypes. And again, as we was talked about um, 
uh, earlier today by, by Matt that um, the targets of UB3A are, are difficult to pin down. The signaling pathways um, that uh, are involved are difficult to pin down. And uh, in one way, what our approach is to identify this sort of uh, cellular functional phenotype and then use that as a way of tracing back to see how is it that UBE3A causes those changes? What are the direct molecular targets of UBE3A? They may be other they may be other parts of the signaling pathway that ultimately lead to these deficits. And part of that problem now is that we see a whole variety of things that are different in these cells. So there's differences in action potential firing and properties and also synaptic properties. And as I mentioned, those things are all confounded during development. If you have changes in the ability of the cell to to display proper action potentials or to release transmitter appropriately, that will change the formation of synapses that will change their ability to be plastic. And so we need to have a way of teasing out which of these things are maybe fundamentally related to, for example, the duplication of UB3A and or other genes that may be involved and then try to use that as a basis for really understanding what the pathway is. And that's important because potentially elements of that signaling pathway could be targets for therapeutic interventions. So we want to make sure we're looking at the ones that are directly causative and are not either confounds or even uh, what could be compensatory changes in response to the specific changes. So the last few slides that I'm going to talk about um, give an example of how we've used this approach uh, in the Angelman neurons. We haven't really gotten to the point of doing some of this in the dupe neurons. Uh, but in the Angelman neurons, we've um, used antisense oligonucleotides to basically uh, mimic the decrease in UBE3A, but be able to do it in a temporally controlled and acute manner. And this is work that was done uh, in collaboration with um, Noel Germain in Stormy's lab and also uh, with Frank Rigo from Ionis Pharmaceuticals who um, designed and um, provided us with these antisense oligonucleotides. So by treating the cells with, the, with the, an ASO targeted against UBE3A, we can knock down UBE3A levels. We can treat the cells basically one time and get a sustained decrease in UBE3A that can last several weeks. And we've, uh, as an initial foray into this, we've treated cells either early, which is around six weeks in development, or late, which is around 18 weeks in development. Uh, let that decrease in UBE3A persist for three weeks and then record the cells. And so <laughs> when we look at um, resting membrane potential and we treat the cells early, we can see that knocking down UBE3A causes a hyperpolarized RMP, mimicking what's seen in the Angelman cells. And this is compared to a scrambled control to control for nonspecific effects. We've also seen it with two different ASOs as, as a control. And then if we treat the cells late at 18 weeks, you can see that in the, um, in the scrambled controls, the RMP is more, depol is more hyperpolarized. So they have shown that normal development. But now we treat with the antisense, and we still get, uh, we still mimic that depolarized RMP that's seen in Angelman neurons. Whoops. As another control, uh, if this is specifically due to knocking down UB3A in neurons, we wouldn't expect it to have any effect on Angelman neurons because they've already lost the UB3A in the neurons. And so that's what's shown here as a control. If we use that same ASO, um, it doesn't seem to be off-target effects because there's no change in resting memory potential of Angelman neurons, as we'd expect. So now we can also use this as a tool to look at other properties. And so here's the action potential firing. And again, if we treat with the ASO against UBE3A early, we see an increase in the proportion of immature cells compared to the scrambled control. But interestingly, if we treat the cells late when they already have a, a greater maturity, there's a, a much more blunted response. There's basically we don't see a reversion to immature properties if we do this uh, late in development. And um, we saw a similar trend for uh, synaptic changes as well. If we knock down UBE3A early and record later, we see, this, we see the same changes that we see in the Angelman uh, patient-derived neurons, but not if we treat late. And so this led to uh, one idea that maybe some of those changes, like the AP firing and the synaptic changes, may actually be secondary to a primary effect on resting membrane potential. And so uh, James did these really nice experiments as just a way to sort of look into that possibility. So what he did is he actually grew cells in the presence of a slightly elevated potassium chloride concentration to mimic a depolarized resting membrane potential in uh, control neurons. And they were treated like this for upwards of 20 weeks. We actually did cell death assays and showed that it didn't increase cell death at all. 
But what you see is that after uh, prolonged treatment with this, under these slightly depolarizing conditions, we actually get uh, a, a, a reversion to immature action potential firing, just as seen in the Angelman neurons. And so I pulled this up at the bottom so you can see that comparison. So um, obviously it's, it's a bit of a crude manipulation, but it's very interesting that the depolarization alone can drive uh, some of these changes, as well as the synaptic changes. Um, so it suggests that those changes in RMP may be uh, one of the more direct uh, consequences of the loss of UBE3A. Uh, <clears throat> we also wanted to see uh, whether we could reverse, sorry, oh, yeah, we, whether we could reverse the phenotype uh, by activating uh, UBE3A. And so we took advantage of this compound topotecan that um, Ben Philpot had identified as a compound that could activate the paternal UBE3A uh, and somewhat restore UBE3A um, levels in Angelman neurons. And so we haven't done this at different time points yet to identify those windows of recovery, but by uh, treating early with topotecan, we can, um, we can actually rescue the resting membrane potential, see the hyperpolarized resting membrane potential in Angelman neurons. We can rescue action potential firing and we can rescue changes in synaptic activity. And so this will also be a great tool for looking at different developmental time points to identify windows of uh, the ability to rescue these different um, aspects of the phenotype and try to, again, separate out what might be uh, primary um, from what might be secondary. And so we're very excited to apply this kind of approach to the dupe neurons as well. Um, we could certainly use an agent like this to increase somewhat UBE3A levels and control neurons. We can also use that antisense oligonucleotide strategy to try to normalize UBE3A levels in dupe neurons and, and see what it does to the um, corresponding aspects of the phenotype. Uh, so I'll, 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 I'll skip through this very quickly, I think, because this is basically what I talked about in terms of our summary, and just flip to the acknowledgments. Um, I've mentioned a few times that uh, James Fink, a graduate student in my lab, has uh, done basically the, the majority of uh, these recordings and also played a, a driving role in this entire uh, project. And, uh, and I'll give one more plug for his talk tomorrow afternoon where he's going to talk about some really interesting aspects of the dupe 15 q neurons. Um, Tawana Robinson is also a very important uh, research associate in the lab, has played a role in developing these cells. And uh, of course, our ongoing collaboration with uh, Stormy and other people at UConn uh, has been critical. And then finally, also uh, our, our funders, in particular, the Duke 15 Q Alliance um, um, provided a graduate fellowship to James, which has uh, greatly uh, facilitated our ability to carry out this work. Thanks. <laughs>